Good afternoon to our East Coast attendees and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. To start, this session is being recorded so we can share it with you after we wrap up today. I'm Carrie Ann James, Chair of the Board of U Aspire. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. This is our first event in the leadership in our leadership series, which gives you aspire partners, founders, and close friends an inside look into the organization's strategy, impact, and vision. Today's topic is economic mobility, a broad and multifaceted issue, uh, which we have much to talk about. Soon we'll hear from Jonathan Lewis, you aspire's senior director of research about his economic mobility research and analysis and how it relates to post-secondary achievement. Then U Aspire CEO, Jacqueline Pinheiro, will connect um, Jonathan's presentation with U Aspire's current impact and share her vision for our way forward. We'll have some time for questions at the end, so please share your questions in the Q&A box as well, and we'll do our best to answer all of them. I'd like to start our session today by introducing U Aspire's new mission statement. Our new mission aligns with U Aspire's growth and evolution to better meet students' needs as the post-secondary and employment landscape, in landscape evolves. We've expanded our definition of success to what we hope to achieve in partnership with our students. We believe post-secondary education education attainment is the foundation for economic mobility, and we know firsthand the complex decisions and calculations that students and families must make to unlock the power of a college degree. U Aspire is committed to being a partner in these decisions and steps. This means deepening our work to help students access all forms of financial aid available, including scholarships and emergency aid, making informed post-secondary decisions and develop, allowing them to develop and skills to navigate the complex financial uh, landscape and educational systems. Students are at the heart of everything we do and this mission reflects our commitment to their aspirations as, and their ability to live the lives they envision for themselves. So without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to Jonathan Lewis to present his research on economic mobility. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Um, my name is Jonathan Lewis, and as Carrie said, I serve as the Senior Director of Research here at U Aspire. And I'm really pleased to be with you today to present a little bit about the um, an overview of a literature review I conducted um, into economic mobility. And with that, um, during the next 15 to 20 minutes or so, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how, how we think about economic mobility, um, we'll turn from there to the factors that contribute to economic mobility, and I'll try to paint a picture for you of what it looks like in America today. After that, I'll pivot a little bit to talk about the role of post-secondary education as far as I can see, and we'll finish up with some key takeaways and recommendations. And from there, I'll hand it over to Jacqueline. So to start, um, how is it that we think about economic mobility? Um, we'll start begin with a formal definition which is that economic mobility is the degree to which a person's income, wealth, occupational prestige, or general socioeconomic status change over time. So two research psychologists investigated perceptions of economic mobility a few years ago and found that we approach this concept with different frames. For example, are we thinking about mobility within our own lifetime or across multiple generations? Are we focused only on upward mobility or considering downward mobility as well? From this and other studies, my main takeaway is that for most of us, economic mobility means a better future for ourselves and for our children. So now turning to what factors contribute to economic mobility, I'm going to borrow the concept of capital from the economics literature as a helpful lens. Different types of capital affect our mobility, and in most cases, these are difficult or impossible for us as individuals to control. So starting on the left side of the slide here, financial capital refers to cash, savings, and other monetary resources available to us now and in the future. In the middle column, which I've labeled human, social, and cultural capital, 
This refers to who we are, who we know, and how we interact with our community. For example, our mobility can be impacted by demographic factors, such as our racial, religious, or gender identities, or our age. Also, by how much knowledge we possess and the credentials we hold. And the same, in fact, goes for our parents. This is why first generation matters so much. The, new, the, the next few bullets in this column refer to capital available to us when we interact with the community. For instance, our social network refers to who we know and whether we can leverage those connections to access other forms of capital. Research has shown that individuals who graduate from college into a recession earn less, not only in their first job, but for the next 10 years, when compared with the average college graduate who enters a robust labor market. And finally, if I, as an individual, am unable to access, for example, labor markets, credit markets, housing markets, et cetera, because of who I am, that will limit my ability to be upwardly mobile. The final column, which I've labeled geographic capital, refers to the variation in capital based on where we live or work. So mobility varies by state, region, neighborhood, and within cities, sometimes even by the street that we live on. For example, residential segregation has been shown to limit upward mobility compared with economically integrated areas. Um, if I am growing up next to a highway, let's say, and breathing fine particulate matter, or if I'm drinking water from degrading lead pipes, then my long-term health will, outcomes will be worse, which will affect my, my own mobility. And similarly, high-quality schools, libraries, physicians, or other medical practitioners, arts, and infrastructure, to name just a few more examples, each plays a role in our ability to access opportunity. I wanted to show you this image from a 2016 study by Raj Chetty, a researcher at Harvard, and some of his colleagues. This gives a little bit more detail on the geographic capital side of things. They found that the odds of an individual who grows up in the bottom 20% of the income ladder and advances to the top 20% within their lifetime varies considerably based on where they live in the United States. So on this map, the darker shaded regions represent smaller odds of significant upward mobility compared with the lighter shaded, shaded regions. One of their recommendations, which to be honest, took me by surprise, was that families in low mobility areas should move to a high mobility area if at all possible. Of course, that is not the advice we give at US Fire, but I found it persuasive that each of us, that where each of us grows up does matter for later life outcomes. So now I'd like to turn to um, describing for you how, what economic mobility looks like in America today. Again, as far as I could tell from the 60 or so papers that I reviewed. Um, and I could sum it up in one word, which is stalled, um, not in a really good place. Um, back to Raj Chetty for a minute. Um, he and colleagues in a different paper, they worked in partnership with researchers at the IRS, examining millions of uh, tax records that were matched among parents and children. They were looking to assess rates of absolute mobility, which is a jargony way of saying whether an individual earns at least a dollar more than their parents by the same age. So in this case, by age 30. So what they found is that roughly 90% of individuals who were born in 1940 passed this test by 1970. However, these rates declined over time, as you can see in the chart. And children born in the early 1980s had only about a 50% chance, or no better than a coin flip, of out-earning their parents by the early 2010s. So some of the reason why we see these patterns, we can look to sort of two main areas, two main culprits, I would say. The first is income concentration and income inequality and wealth gaps. And I'm gonna talk about each of those now. So we'll start with income. Um, I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that there's high levels of income concentration in our country, but just seeing the numbers can sometimes be staggering. Um, this is recently released data from the Census Bureau about last year. So this is uh, this pie chart on the left um, encapsulates all income that was earned in 2022. And what it shows is that the top 20%, which reflects individuals earning $153,000 a year or more, brought in more than half of all income that was earned in the country last year. While the bottom 20% of wage earners, the same number of individuals, just those who are earning under $30,000, represented just 3% of all income. Um, now, diving a little bit more deeply into that top 20%, I would direct your attention to the uh, graph on the right, to the donut chart. Um, so this is the darker shaded region is looking at the top 5% of wage earners, individuals with incomes of 295,000 and above. 
which that small group um, brought in almost a quarter of all income that was earned last year. So high levels of concentration, and these have been, uh, this has been a continuing pattern for years. Now, income concentration is multifactorial, which means there's a lot of reasons why we experience this phenomenon, from decreasing rewards to those with a high school diploma only, or the decline of manufacturing and labor unions in America. One factor which has been a continual presence for decades is labor market discrimination, most notably in the form of lower compensation for jobs held by Black and African Americans. On this slide, I'm showing you a chart of median household income broken out by racial identity group, going all the way back to 1967. This is also from Census Bureau. And what it shows is that Black Americans in particular have been earning less um, at the median, which is sort of the middle household, um, than any other racial group, all the way back as far as records have been kept. Um, and this quote on the left I found particularly powerful. In every cohort since 1880, so or just a few years after the tragic end of Reconstruction, Black men have had less upward mobility and lower average income than white men from similarly ranked childhood households. So that's just a little, little snippet and a little window into what's going on with income inequality and income concentration. Um, and it's data like this that animates our race equity focus at US Fire, motivates our desire to support communities of color. So now I'd like to turn from income inequality to wealth gaps. And we'll start with a quote from Dr. Nicole Hannah-Jones, who is a professor at Howard University and the creator of the 1619 Project. Wealth, not simply securing equal rights, is the means to security in America. It is what ensures what every parent wants, that your children will have fewer struggles than you did. It is not incidental that wealthier people are healthier and live longer. But wealth is not something most people create solely by themselves. It is accumulated across generations. And so with that, I'd like to show you this chart from an economist at Princeton University and her colleagues who sought to model the, the white black wealth gap going all the way back to the Civil War. And I'll talk about the chart on the right before reading the quote on the left, which is to say that back in 1860, when most black Americans were held as a form of wealth by a small planter class of white Americans, the, the, the wealth gap was about 60 to one. And then as you move through the Civil War and emancipation and reconstruction, that line plummets. And by the time you get to 1910, the wealth gap is about 10 to one. And then the authors call this a hockey stick chart because the line turns pretty significantly at that point. And over the next 40 years, the convergence slows. By the time you get to 1950, we're looking at a gap of about seven to one. And then, and I find this part both as tragic as it is surprising to me when I first came across it, that over the 70 year period between 1950 and 2020, or encompassing the entire civil rights movement, um, the gap barely closed any longer, only till about six to one. And so then this quote comes from their paper um, on the left. Starting in the 80s, the authors documented a widening of the racial gap in capital gains, as well as a complete stalling of, in of income convergence. These forces have caused the wealth gap to leave the convergence path altogether and to start increasing again. And I find that pretty scary because if this, if this chart, which covers 160 years, was able to zoom out and look at 160 years forward from here, it's frightening to me to think that this, that we might actually see the line depart from the x-axis and increase again. So um, from this, I would like to now talk a little bit about the role that post-secondary education appears to play in this complex system, these complex systems. Um, and I, I call it complicated because um, spend, I've spent more than 20 years in and around higher education. And my sense is that what colleges give with one hand, they take away with the other hand. So there's, there's a mixed bag here. So we'll start with the good news. Um, more education clearly predicts higher earnings. This chart that I'm showing you comes from the Georgetown Center on Education and the Workforce. And what they found in their analysis is that median workers with a high school diploma or GED earn slightly more than about $40,000 annually, starting around age 40. But if, you've, if you look at the lines above that, um, essentially the annual earnings increase again at the median with each level of education going all the way up to the top line which are, um, represent professional degree holders. And these patterns then play out over the course of a working lifetime, and, and so they'll show up in lifetime earning figures as well. Some other positive trends. Of the 4,000 or so institutions of higher education in the country, some appear to be very successful at producing upward mobility. As one example, I read a few papers about historically Black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, which educate more than twice as many Americans from the bottom 40% of the income ladder. 
and help students reach the top 60% at rates double the national average among all colleges and universities. So this may not be the case for all, not for each, each of the 99 HBCUs, but many of them, this is true. I also dug a bit into community colleges and career and technical education programs in Massachusetts and California, where we work with, um, with high school students as well as college students, and what we are post-secondary. And what we found is that um, degree completion um, and, uh, and career ed programs are both associated with increased employment, increased earnings, in some cases, very shortly after finishing a program. So there are definitely some positive trends, it's not all bad news in the world of higher ed. Um, unfortunately, there are just so many exceptions that we have to really consider. Um, so starting with cost, since that's where you aspire spends a lot of its energy, students from low income families have to leverage about 150% of annual household income to cover just a single year at a bachelor's degree granting institution, compared to about 14% for those growing up in high income families. Um, beyond cost, higher education reinforces historic discrimination, both intentionally and unintentionally, limiting, aspect, excuse me, limiting access for underrepresented minorities and women to certain high paying occupations. This happens at the higher paying STEM end, as well as sort of at the career technical trade end. Um, earnings outcomes also vary tremendously. So I showed you that chart earlier. It suggests more education is always better, but actually it varies based on who we are, our demographics, our human capital, our social capital as well as where we went to school and what we studied and what degree we attained and what job we went into after college. And first generation college grads in particular, um, even though we even, especially as we celebrate their completion of degrees, they still walk away with more debt and earn less and hold less wealth on average when compared with peers who are not the first in their families to go to college. So again, lots of exceptions. I would like to show you a couple of charts, uh, charts that I've labeled sort of intersectional analysis. It's important to examine both income and wealth with an intersectional lens to ensure that the guidance we provide to students and families is narrowly tailored to their circumstances. So for instance, this chart illustrates lifetime earnings by level of education and racial identity. So if you look at the third line from the bottom um, and pay attention to the middle dot, which is the median. So the median black American with a high school diploma is forecast to earn approximately $1.4 million over their working lifetime. At the master's level, all the way at the right, this forecast nearly doubles to almost to about 2.7 million. So if, if we are looking only within groups, it makes sense not only for Black Americans, but for everyone to pursue additional education. And yet what this masks is the intergroup realities. So let's compare that 2.7 million that we just looked at to the 2.9 million median earnings for a white American with only a bachelor's degree. That's in the top row. So these are population level trends. And so any individual may be an exception, but the pattern is concerning because master's degree programs are typically quite expensive with little in the way of grants or scholarship funds. So if we recognize that black families in America have in general, less access to intergenerational wealth, then a graduate degree is likely to require additional borrowing or what one of the scholars I read called negative wealth generation. And the payoff may not exceed the median white peer who did not require the advanced degree. So you can see how it starts to get complicated, difficult to figure out precisely what advice to give. One more chart. Um, this is now turning from income to wealth. So this is looking at wealth among young people ages 25 to 35, again, by race and level of education. The takeaways for me from this chart are that young black men and women have less wealth than peers with other racial identities and that the median Black woman in particular, between the ages of 25 and 35, with less than a bachelor's degree, possesses wealth that is indistinguishable from zero. And in fact, across every race and ethnic group, young women have lower net worth than young men. So this is why I say I think it's important to take an intersectional perspective when looking at data to figure out exactly what to do with the realities in which we find ourselves. So I'd like to leave you with a few key takeaways. Um, so we'll start by saying economic mobility in general means a better future for ourselves and our children. That's how most of us think about this. There are so many factors that influence economic mobility, and most are difficult for us as individuals to control or influence. Economic mobility for white Americans has clearly stalled when compared with earlier generations. And yet the legacies of slavery, racism, and multiple forms of oppression have ensured lower income, less wealth, 
and lower mobility among Black Americans going all the way back to the Civil War. More education does predict higher earnings both annually and over one's working lifetime. But there are so many exceptions to the rule that it doesn't make it a clean message to just say everyone should go for the highest degree they can possibly attain. So looking ahead, I, from everything I've read, it seems to me that structural barriers will continue to frustrate upward mobility. And yet in this environment, what USFIRE does really well is we help our stakeholders access forms of financial and human capital that are necessary for upward mobility, but that society is not doing a very good job of moving from those who have to those who don't. And so to realize this mission that Carrie mentioned a few minutes ago, our programs and services must amplify the transfer of capital. Everything we do needs to pass this litmus test. We have to figure out how to ensure we are doing even more transfer of financial and human capital in order to realize that mission of upward mobility. And so with that, I will be happy to take your questions at the end, but for now, I'm going to pass it over to Jacqueline and thank you so much for your attention. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jonathan, for your research and sharing all of that with us today. My name is Jacqueline Pinheiro, and I am honored to be here with you as you Aspire CEO. Thank you again for joining us for this heavy yet very critical conversation about the landscape before us. As Jonathan mentioned, I'm excited to spend a few minutes with you connecting everything that Jonathan has taught us, is here to speak with you all about today, to the future decisions that we make as you aspire and with um, the focus on the resources that we do have. So today we started off with our new mission and our new mission sharpens and uplifts the focus of what you aspire's work has always been about, removing those structural barriers to post-secondary pathways in education for students who have been historically underrepresented in higher education so that they have the knowledge and the financial capital to build the life that they envision for themselves. As Jonathan said, the research shows that a college degree still is an important lever in economic mobility in America. But we know, based on the research that we just heard, that college attendance alone cannot secure or guarantee financial well-being. And again, we know that because paying for college remains a high stakes financial decision that students and families continue to have to make alone and in the dark. They do not have clear, consistent, actionable support, information, navigation support, and they're too often left to finance that education with debt. And then we know that that debt limits or narrows the economic opportunities that that education should have positioned that individual to unlock. So where does this take us? As you see on the next slide, you Aspire's impact models, the five that you have here, are designed specifically to facilitate the transfer of knowledge and the transfer of financial capital. Through our advising, training, and technical assistance work, our amazing teams of experts build knowledge capital by helping students and their families navigate and understand the systems of financial aid. And then our teams continue to transfer that financial capital that's locked in those systems and help students access the dollars that are available through forms of financial aid, including federal support, state government support, and financial support that's available at institutions of higher education alike. We continue to transfer financial capital through our direct to student funds work. And that comes in the form of helping students access scholarships and also to secure emergency aid when life challenges arise, like they inevitably do for all of us. And finally, our policy and our consulting work those teams work with leaders and policymakers to transform the opaque, inequitable systems that students, their families, and really in many parts of our country, entire communities have to figure out how to operate within or operate around. 
So we want to go in and change those systems. We want to make those systems transparent. We want to make them equitable. We want to center them on the student's experience and needs to further facilitate both the transfer of knowledge and financial capital into the community. The goal of you Aspire's work is focused on creating a different future reality, a future in which underrepresented students can seamlessly access the dollars that are there to support their bright futures and fulfilling careers. So as we think about our way forward, and as you Aspire evolves to better meet our students' needs, we will strengthen and focus on our ability to transfer both financial and knowledge capital directly to them. Building on 40 years of student advising and financial aid expertise, and through our recent research that you've heard about today and our strategic plan, we are prioritizing the following four growth areas, and I'm excited to briefly take you through them. So first of all, we will be focusing on expanding our content and curriculum. While you Aspire's focus remains on the ultimate attainment of a college degree, our students are asking us a little bit more frequently, what else can I do with the financial aid that I'm eligible for and that my you Aspire advisor is helping me to unlock? We, we hear students say, I want a college degree, that, may, that remains my goal. However, for a variety of reasons, where else might I be able to start my education post high school? And because we advise, and most importantly, learn from over 10,000 students a year, we're expanding our knowledge base and we're expanding our curriculum, our advising curriculum in particular, to serve students and to transfer that knowledge about a variety of post-secondary pathways, including associate's degrees and bachelor's degrees. But there are many other options that we wanna make sure a student and their family is made aware of, that they can use those dollars and translate that into continuing education. We will also be expanding our training and technical assistance content to build out loan debt and repayment curriculum. We know through our work with thousands of counselors every year across the country that there is a critical void of information about loans, taking on debt, repayment scenarios that counselors are sitting down having with their students. These are not conversations that you can kind of muddle your way through or take a fly by your seat of the pants approach. These are critical, long lasting, imperative conversations that we want to help strengthen our counselors with the correct information and support to have those conversations. Secondly, we will be increasing our focus on direct to student funding. We see the tremendous immediate impact this direct transfer of financial capital has for our students. This past year alone, you Aspire distributed $480,000 in scholarships and emergency aid. And while this represents a drop in the bucket in terms of the financial support that students need, we know that this work makes all of the difference in whether a student is able to stay in school and stay on track to completing their program or to their degree. A quick example of this, is one of our students who is studying at Vassar College. She unfortunately had her scholarship decreased because she did everything else right. She found more grant aid to bring in so that she wasn't at having to work so hard or add so much additional money um, to pay for her bill. But unfortunately, when that scholarship was decreased, she was then given a $7,000 bill to re-enroll in college the next year. Thankfully for her, she is a U Aspire advisee. And thankfully for, for the support that we've received from many of you on this call, we have the financial capital to, have trans, to be able to transfer to her. We gave her $7,000 because of this switch in her, um, having her scholarship decreased. And she told us because of that transfer of that financial capital, that ability to be connected to our programs that she says, quote, I was in danger of stopping out of college. And without the support, I don't know what I would have done. 
And that is the power of our direct to student funds program. And that is just one of many examples is why we are increasing our focus on this work. Continuing on, we will be deepening our advocacy. We've experienced promising results and big wins from our team focused on federal and state policy in Massachusetts, in California, and in New York. And to give you a quick example, just a few short weeks ago, as a result of our advocacy and in partnership with a broader coalition of stakeholders, the California governor signed, law, signed into law a set of reforms to financial aid policies that for years you Aspire advisors had been helping students navigate. And the set of reforms against this policy is called Satisfactory Academic Progress, or SAP. So bear with me just a little bit more as I share a, with some more details about this, because this is such a huge win for our students, and it is also a model for possible reforms across the country. So under SAP, students are required to pass a certain number of classes at a certain rate to keep their financial aid in place. But the way that colleges enforce this policy is extremely complicated, and it can result in a student that is on financial aid, in particular a Pell Grant, they can lose that aid when they need it the most to stay in college, when they're experiencing either a personal emergency or a life challenge that is complicating their academic success and their academic progress. But because of the reforms that we advocated for and through the passage of this law, now more low-income students will be able to keep their financial aid and keep the support that they need to stay in college. This win also highlights the extraordinary impact of our student policy fellowship. I'll give you a quick example of that. Andrea Dargo, who is one of you Aspire's California fellows, she's a student parent at California State University, Long Beach. She worked closely with our teams to meet with legislative offices, to testify at hearings, all in support of these SAP reforms because of her own experiences, losing her financial aid at a moment in time when she was navigating a personal emergency. And then when she was able to try to re-enroll in college years later, she was continuously denied her financial aid. We cannot be complacent or complicit when we know that broken systems and policies like SAP persist and continue to hurt students year after year. Finally, we will be uh, maintaining a focus or growing our focus, I should say, on strategic partnerships. Through this body of work, you Aspire will be, will be positioning ourselves to meet the widespread demand for accurate and trustworthy financial information and solutions by partnering with educational institutions, other nonprofits, other student-facing organizations who have an extensive reach and trusted relationships with students who need additional assistance, navigation, knowledge, and financial support about what it means to continue their post-secondary pathway. A recent example of this growing strategic partnership work is a consulting partnership with the College Board. Many of you might be familiar with the College Board. They are a nonprofit that prepares students to transition to college through programs like the SAT, the Advanced Placement Program, and Big Future, which is a web platform with 15 million student and parent users a year. You Aspire's consulting team partnered with the Big Futures team and provided guidance on the content and the structure of the pay for college section of the Big Futures platform, making the information more accessible, more useful, more understandable and relatable for first-gen and low-income students. This partnership has been unbelievably critical for you Aspire because alone we could not have reached those millions of students without connecting our organizations and figuring out ways to do things differently. There is plenty of work to go around for the ecosystem of post-secondary attainment and entry and access and the growth of our strategic partners 
will allow you aspire to transfer and translate our expert knowledge for students who might not be able to connect in with our programs on their own. At U Aspire, we've always known that to create meaningful change for students, we must not only support and empower their individual pathways, but also to, it is important for us to address the disproportionate structural and financial barriers that they face. And as you've heard today, U Aspire is both uniquely and well positioned to meet that vision and our goals. So at this point, we want to translate and, and give the mic over to you all. So we'd love to start taking some questions. I'll turn it over to Carrie to move us into the question and answer segment. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. If you have questions about what Jacqueline and Jonathan just talked about, please use the, the Q&A feature. We have about 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, and if we, again, if we do not get to your question, we will follow up with you directly post this event. Um, the first question is for you, Jonathan. At a national level, what policies could make a meaningful difference in improving economic mobility? Thank you, Carrie. Um, that's a really great question. I think there are lots of different programs and policies that are being that are being attempted both at the post at the institutional level as well as in organizations like ours. Um, a lot of it for me sort of centers on more intrusive advising. Intrusive advising is a phrase that comes from the academic advising literature. Um, in order to help direct students to colleges with better outcomes or to programs that better fit their interests. Um, you know, so for example, there are the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center estimates that there's about 40 million Americans with some college credits, but no credential. And some of those individuals need a credential in order to access the next job or to realize um, an increase in their salary or to finish what they started. And for those individuals, for example, they need very specific advice. But that's not everyone in that group. That's a really diverse group. And there are individuals who might say, you know what, I tried post-secondary ed. It's not for me. I need another pathway. So figuring out what does that advice look like for someone who has tried college, maybe taken on some debt or not, but then decided maybe this path isn't for me and I need to figure out another way to try to be upwardly mobile that doesn't run through an associate or bachelor's degree program. So I would say specific intrusive advising um, is something that I think could make a big difference as well as really trying to identify those pathways. Jacqueline alluded to this earlier identifying those pathways, the non-degree pathways, to help those with a high school diploma to navigate labor market discrimination and obtain what um, Tony Carnevale at the Georgetown Center calls a good job, like a job with a livable wage based on the region where someone is living. So hopefully that answers the question. Those are just a few thoughts off the top of my head. Yes, and I think it also helps answer um, the, the set part of the second question, which is, you know, what are some of the examples of the alternative pathways your students are exploring? Um, and maybe Jacqueline, if you can expand on that a bit. Sure, absolutely. Um, we are still learning and having conversations with our students about the pathways that they're looking at and they're, or they're interested in. And I want to piggyback on something that Jonathan just said, that it is very regionally focused and sometimes very city specific focus in terms of the options that are available outside of an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. So for example, some of the programs that we hear our students ask about uh, tend to be in the tech field. Um, there's a lot of information about boot camp and, and uh, programmer programs and um, the, the wage benefits that come along um, in the tech industry. So we are learning more about that. Um, we also have students continuing to ask about the military um, and what that option could be post high school. Um, we also have conversations about trades in green energy um, and pathways associated um, in those fields and some traditional trades programs, electrician, plumbing, et cetera. So, it really continues to be a variety of conversations that we are hearing and continuing to learn. And from all of that learning in those conversations, it's then on, on our to-do list 
um, to help connect where the dollars are available to those programs and to help to make sure that they are programs of quality. So we still have a ways to go in building out this curriculum, um, but we already have a, a lot of information directly from our students about the information that we need to learn and then turn back around and have those conversations directly with them. And that is the benefit of having the direct student contact and really getting additional information as we go. Um, another question came in, Jacqueline, um, that you mentioned doing more with direct transfer of financial capital. Can you say more about that? Um, US Fire will be doing more fundraising to award scholarships to its direct service advisees. Kind of how does that look? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for the question. It is twofold, really. Um, most of it does come from individual donations and donors who are interested in utilizing you aspire to make that direct transfer of financial capital to our students. Um, so yes, it does involve fundraising and specifically earmarking those dollars for the direct to student transfer. It also comes in the form of administering scholarships uh, for other organizations, corporations, foundations um, that don't want to recreate infrastructure to move those dollars, but can use you Aspire and the way in which we approach our scholarship um, program to focus those dollars on first-gen, low-income students of color who need those dollars. Um, and who are disproportionately shut out from a lot of those systems where those dollars are available. So it really does um, kind of rest in more of a traditional fundraising approach, um, but really the, it can come from a variety of places. Again, corporations, foundations, individuals. It is absolutely something that you aspire to. Um, is very proud of and wants to continue to grow because we have those trusting relationships with so many students and we uniquely know what the situation is, the time that they need that, that aid, um, and it has a much more deeper impact for the students that we're working with. Thanks for that. Um, Jonathan, maybe a question for you. How can you aspire and other organizations best measure success within their students' economic mobility over time? How do you think about that framework of measuring success? A really great question. Economic mobility is something that happens over generations, right? And so um, what I think the I think the way to sort of translate that theory to practice or theory to action, is to try to figure out what are the micro level behaviors, actions um, that we are able to observe and can, um, can, that can provide some evidence of moving in the right direction. So enrolling in college and staying in college is likely one of those metrics, right? Another could be um, reducing or eliminating the amount of debt that a student is taking on, sort of tracking like Students who attend XYZ school took out an average or median amount of debt this year, but the next year our advisees who attended there were able to take out less in debt and trying to parse is that because of additional institutional scholarships or private scholarships or a reduction in the cost of attendance and increase in the Pell Grant. What are the reasons why um, ultimately a student might be able to access more grant or scholarship aid and, and reduce the amount of debt they have to take on? Um, and then I would say some of the harder work that we're engaged with, I'm working with some colleagues on this right now, is to try to look across a lens. There's not a lot of great data about non-degree pathways. Um, there's, a, there's a website called Credential Engine that I think counts over a million different um, pathways in the United States, and two -thirds of, roughly two-thirds of them are non-degree seeking specifically, and there's not a lot of great data. So figuring out how can we try to unpack, as Jacqueline said, the regionally specific options that are available to students for whom higher education is not their desired or possibly realistic pathway, and then figure out, well, so among the options that they are interested in and, and, and are accessible to them, which ones are likelier to lead towards better economic outcomes in the form of employment, in the form of a livable wage, in the form of being able to access housing that is affordable, meeting basic needs. Um, so it's um, it's a real challenge. 
because we have not perfect data, but better data about the higher ed universe, less data, less good data about outside of that. So that was a little bit in the weeds, but I think it's about trying to figure out what are those micro level observations that we can find within pathways to show evidence of moving towards something that ultimately will, will expand over the course of a lifetime or gener multiple generations. It's definitely something that evolves over many years rather than um, one year to the next. Um, another question that came in, uh, Jonathan, maybe this one's for you. How can those who have generational wealth help bridge this social and educational gap? You aspire is obviously one way, but on a legislative level, is there an agenda to focus on and support, uh, focus on and support that currently exists? It's a great question. I think that, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is when the higher education higher education industry and all of us had to sort of stomach the um the end of race conscious admissions um at the end of june and how that was not a perfect system but it was what we had to try to achieve better race equity in higher ed and thinking about creative solutions that institutions region states are trying to pursue in order to help those who have been have been historically marginalized or excluded from higher education to access. Um, one example specifically I think of is I've heard that there are, I've read that there are some initiatives to try to ensure that legacy admissions is no longer permitted. Um, you know, there was a famous statistic in the New York Times, I think at this point, four or five years ago, showing that that some of the most name brand well-known um, selective institutions in the country, there were more students from the top 1% than from the bottom 60% of the income ladder. And there was a recent paper out of Opportunity Insights where Raj Chetty and his colleagues work that showed that a lot of the selective institutions continue to reinforce that privilege across generations. So making sure that legacy admissions is something that universities do not practice anymore, I think would be one promising pathway. But I, I would say that there, there is some more creative, creative, um, creative work being done in the legislative arena. Um, and I wish my colleague Annika were here because she could say a little bit more on that than me. I can jump in really quickly, Carrie, and, and round out um, the great answer from Jonathan because our, um, yes, you aspire absolutely is one one way to help bridge um, the the social educational gap from a on the ground perspective. Um, but from some other legislative at the federal level that I think is important for our attendees um, and those who are on this call today to understand is, and this gets really in the weeds, but um, something that has been in in the New York Times and in other um, publications is about the aid offers. So when a student or a family receives multiple financial aid um, offers from various schools that they might have been accepted to, there's zero standardization across those aid offers. So it really is a consumer protection issue. Um, when you go to buy a house or when you go to buy a car, there has been federal legislation that standardizes the information that the consumer must have when signing on that bottom line. That does not exist in the higher education system. And so a student is left to make these apples to orange comparisons and um, not have the information or the knowledge to understand, well, is this a loan? Is this free money? What does this mean? So I just really wanted to highlight that that's one place of both, there's legislative and federal action um, being discussed around that. But then there's also a set of, uh, I think it's over 300 colleges and universities right now that are taking a look at that themselves and saying, we know that as a system, we need to do better. And this is one place where we can provide more transparent, clear, and again, consumer protections for this purchase that individuals and families are making, which tends to be outside of a mortgage, the largest purchase that any individual will make in their lifetime. So that's one very specific example, but it also goes back to the intricacies of making sure that we are listening to students and their experiences on the ground, and then translating that up to the systems of government that have the power to make these, these changes and to help bridge that divide. And I think that leads nicely into the, the next question, which is 
how does the policy fellowship program fit into advancing this mission? Sure, I'll, I'll start us off. Um, it, it is the core of our mission and the core of that is ensuring that everything we do is focused on what the student needs. And our, our whole organization would not exist without the millions of conversations that we have every single year to understand what a student is going through. And really at the legislative level, um, our policymakers and those who are writing laws and have that power, we have seen the importance of having those direct conversations and for the student to share what their direct experience has been. Um, because our legislators are at a different level and they're, they're not necessarily like you aspire on the ground every day working, it is important for an organization like you aspire to have our policy fellows program to bring those experiences directly to the seat of power and to ensure that those who have the experiences and those that have been most directly affected by policies and laws that are in place have the connection and the access to those people in power who have to keep changing and evolving those rules and those laws to make the system better for students. That is the core of our policy fellowship program. We will continue to fundraise for that program because it is so critical and pivotal at the um, systemic level. Thanks so much. And this will be our, our last question, just checking in on the time. Um, advocating for policy change can take a long time as, as you highlighted. Um, how is you Aspire helping students in the short term? Sure, I'll take that one again. And Jonathan, please jump in here as well. Um, it really goes back to the three areas of advising, training and technical assistance, and the direct-to-student funds work. That is the day-to-day -day, um, investment of the resources that we have while we work on the longer term policy changes. Um, that's, why you, that's why you Aspire has this um, uh, continuum of service. We know that by being on the ground with students in the short term every day, helping them get the dollars that are available, analyze their aid offers, put those dollars into schools that they will have a better chance of graduating from, have better outcomes, less debt, shorter time to degree, et cetera. That work is critical. Um, and it helps to build our case, our understanding, and then packaging the solutions that then have to go to the legislatures, to the you know, state and federal governments to say, this is what needs to be changed. This is how we can maybe one day decrease the short-term actions that we have to, that we are doing every single day and change the system um, to have longer-term effects. So it really goes back to the core of our advising um, directly with students, our training and technical assistance with the amazing cadre of counselors who tirelessly work with hundreds of students a day um, in these massive caseloads. Um, to help them also figure out how to help students through these conversations. Um, and finally, just getting more money into students' pockets at the end of the day. Well, thank you so much. That concludes our first Leadership Series event. We are so grateful to you, our many close friends, for joining us today. And we look forward to continuing the conversation and connecting with each one of you again sometime soon. Thank you so much and have a great day.